Um, so today I'm going to talk about block LUT smoothers for p multigrid methods in ISO geometric analysis. Uh, the work I'm going to present is joint work together with Matthias Müller and Kees Fuig. Before I will say something more about these LUT smoothers and these p multigrid methods, let me start with a basic introduction to isogeometric analysis. So isogeometric analysis, or IGA, can be considered as an extension of the finite element method, which basically means that the solution procedure is based on a variational formulation. And um, to approximate both the solution and the geometry in this variational form, we adopt uh, B-spline basis functions. So these basis functions are defined on a parametric domain. So on this slide, it's called omega h hat. hat. And then a uh, global mapping is constructed from our geometry of interest, omega h, to this parametric domain where the B-splines are defined. And since we're using these flexible B-splines, we obtain a description of the geometry which is highly accurate throughout computation, uh, all computational steps. So throughout this presentation, I would like to consider the convection diffusion reaction equation as a model problem, uh, which is shown on this slide. And as you would do with the finite element method, we're going to uh, multiply this equation with a test function and apply integration by parts. And if we do so, we obtain the following uh, variational form. And uh, the key idea now is that we use so-called uh, B-spline basis functions to discretize this variational formulation. Um, it's important to notice that B-spline basis functions can be uh, defined for arbitrary approximation orders. Um, so for example, for P equals one, we obtain linear B-spline basis functions, which are basically the piecewise continuous uh, hat functions that probably everyone knows from standard finite elements. But if we increase the order of the B-splines, we already uh, see much more exotic uh, spline fun uh, basis functions. So for example, on the right side of the slide, you see quadratic B-spline basis functions, which look uh, significantly different than uh, what you are uh, used to probably. So in general, B-spline basis functions uh, have some interesting properties. So first of all, they have a compact support, even though it increases with the approximation order. But in any case, we obtain sparse system matrices in the end. Furthermore, they are uh, strictly positive. And this implies that the uh, mass matrix consists of uh, uh, elements which are all larger or equal to zero. And finally, they possess the partition of unity property, which means that if we want to lump a mass matrix, that we can already do this within the variational form. These last two uh, properties, so this uh, uh, strictly positiveness and partition of unity property, we will use that later on in this presentation. But therefore, it's, uh, I want to highlight this a little bit. So based on the variational formulation, we start discretizing this with uh, uh, B-splines to obtain the uh, Galerkin formulation. And basically what we obtain is a linear system of equations. So we have A times U equals F. And here the subscripts H uh, stands for the, the mesh width, so to say, so the amount of spline functions that we have. Uh, and P denotes the approximation order. And if we would now plot the condition number of, uh, let's say, the stiffness matrix for a fixed mesh width and uh, different values of P, then we would see that the condition number scales exponentially uh, with the approximation order. And as a consequence, standard iterative solvers become less and less efficient if we consider uh, higher values of P. So to overcome this problem, uh, different solution strategies have been pursued. Um, one can think, for example, about H multigrid methods with special smoothers. So a couple of examples are shown on this slide. Uh, preconditioners have been developed specifically for uh, the IGA context. And the solution strategy that we are uh, adopting and uh, about which I will talk now are so-called P multigrid methods. Um, 
And the use of p-multigrid methods is motivated by the fact that if we look at our linear system, we know that it becomes more and more difficult to solve for uh, uh, increasing values of p. And at the same time, uh, it reduces to standard uh, c0 fem for p equals 1. Uh, and we know that uh, at p equals 1, we obtain the standard c0 fem. So h multigrid with, for example, gauss seidel is an... Uh, quite an established uh, solution technique. Um, it's important to notice that uh, within IGA, if we look at different P levels, that the degrees of freedoms, uh, the number of degrees of freedom basically remains more or less similar, uh, but the stencil significantly reduces on, cor on coarser P levels. So if you compare the stencil at P equals one compared to P equals five, you see quite a big difference, especially in higher dimensions. Uh, and finally, it's uh, good to note that in general these spaces are not nested because the uh, low order uh, basis functions have a significantly lower continuity than the high order ones. Um, so how does the p multigrid uh, now look like? So suppose we are going to solve a linear system of equations discretized with third order b-spline basis functions. Uh, then we construct a hierarchy based on different uh, values of p and different values of h. Um, and after applying smoothing on the high order level, we go directly to level p equals 1, where we obtain uh, a coarse grid correction. And uh, since we have uh, like standard uh, linear basis functions over there, we just apply a standard h multigrid method with gauss seidel as a smoother. And once we obtain this coarse grid correction, coarse grid correction we uh, update our solution on the high order level to uh, conclude our V cycle, so to say. To transfer information from one level to another, we have to define prolongation and restriction operators. Um, to prolongate and restrict in uh, H, uh, it's, it's quite standard, so we do linear interpolation and we do the transpose of it for the restriction. To prolongate between the different P levels, we have a slightly different operator, uh, which is basically consists of two parts. So it's a rectangular matrix and uh, the inverse of a mass matrix. And uh, basically, this is uh, based on L2 projection. Um, it's important to notice here that we're not really solving a linear system of equations here, but actually we're applying uh, row sum uh, lumping uh, which can be done because uh, we have the partition of unity property and all the entries of the mass matrix are positive, so we can do that without uh, any problems. Uh, so basically we use a lumped L2 projection to uh, prolongate and restrict between the different uh, P levels. Um, question remains which mover you have to use at a high order level. So on the uh, level P equals 1, we can just use gauss seidel but using gauss seidel on the high order level uh, doesn't really lead to an efficient uh, multigrid method. Uh, and to illustrate that, I plotted the spectrum of the iteration matrix uh, for the p-multigrid method using gauss seidel as a high order smoother for p equals 2 and p equals 3. And what we see is that the spectrum becomes closer and closer towards the unit circle, which basically implies uh, slower and slower convergence. So instead, we're going to use an incomplete LU factorization as a smoother, uh, which basically uh, has two uh, thresholds. So first of all, it drops all elements lower than a certain tolerance. And furthermore, it only keeps the n largest uh, element in each row. Uh, and uh, here, n is the average number of non-zero entries of the original operator. And we apply the smoother uh, as described on the slide. So if we now compare the spectrum of the iteration matrix of the p-multigrid method with those two smoothers again, well, we see a big difference. So with uh, LUT, we remain uh, nicely close to the origin, uh, implying a fast convergence. And the nice thing actually is that if we go from p equals 2 to p equals 3 or p equals 4, we see that the spectrum with gauss seidel as a high-order smoother comes closer and closer to the unit circle. But with LUT, we remain nicely uh, close to the origin. If we now look at the iteration numbers, then we basically see what we expect. So 
both smoothers lead to H-independent convergence. For example, here in this Poisson equation. So if you look at the if you look at the columns, you see more or less the same uh, numbers. But if you uh, now focus on Gauss-Seidel and you look for different p-values, so like horizontally, you say that it uh, grows quite fast in p actually. Uh, if we compare it to LUT, it remains more or less constant in p as well. And I highlighted here for p equals five, you already see that there's a like a factor of 150 in iterations a difference between the two. If we slightly change our model problem and we end up with a real uh, CDR equation, we already see that Gauss-Seidel doesn't even lead to a converging multigrid me uh, method anymore. But at the same time, the LUT smoother still performs quite nicely. Apart from iteration numbers, we also checked the computational efficiency. And to do that, we compared our P multigrid with the LUT smoother to a uh, state-of-the-art H multigrid method so from 2017. And what we see is that uh, basically we are, we are slower because of the high setup costs of the smoother. Uh, but at the same time, the time to solve the linear system of equations is very, uh, very small, actually. Uh, so if you would consider a problem where you have multiple right-hand sides and the same uh, uh, matrix, and then you already see that it becomes more advantages, advantages to uh, consider the LUT smoother. I started the presentation with uh, explaining how the basis functions are defined on the parametric domain and that we construct a mapping between the geometry and the parametric domain. Um, you can imagine that sometimes geometries can be so difficult that uh, such a mapping does not exist. It's not uh, a bijective mapping anymore. Uh, in that case, we divide our uh, geometry omega in non-overlapping subdomains called patches, and each patch gets their own mapping. And as a result, the uh, operator, like a stiffness operator, has a block structure, and each patch leads to a single block. Uh, on this slide, you see in the on the left part, you see the uh, stiffness matrix for a Poisson equation consisting of four patches, as we see the four blocks. And on the right hand side, you see the global LUT factorization. And uh, what we're now going to try to do is to make use of this block structure to come up with a block LUT smoother. This basically starts with the uh, observation that we can write our uh, block diagonal matrix with uh, interface entries on the sides as the multiplication of two other matrices. So where uh, one matrix consists mainly of the lower triangular part uh, of the matrix, uh, and the uh, other matrix consists of the uh, upper triangular part if we perform an LU decomposition. Um, and then we define the, the BI and CI and S in such a way that if we multiply this, that we, can, that we still get our original matrix back. And the key idea now is to replace uh, the LU factorization again by an incomplete LU factorization. Uh, and basically, in all the other uh, matrices like the BI, CI, and the S, we uh, consider the, the incomplete uh, versions of it. Um, what's important to notice is that these uh, LI tilde and UI tilde can be determined in parallel. And the in inversions that you saw on the previous slides are avoided by solving uh, an uh, equivalent linear system of equations with. Uh, multiple right-hand sides. So here again, you see the global IUT factorization on the left, and in the right, on the right side of the slide, you see the uh, block IUT factorization. And so you really see this block structure now, now popping up in the factorization as well. Um, to compare these both smoothers, we consider the Poisson equation on a Yeti footprint. So this uh, uh, geometry consists of 21 different patches to construct this, this footprint in the end. Uh, and if we compare the iteration numbers of the global LUT matrix with the block LUT matrix, we basically see that the block LUT, a block LUT smoother on the high order level leads to a lower number of iterations. Um, both of them show more or less uh, H independent and P independent convergence. So to conclude this talk, uh, the take-home message is that P multigrid methods 
uh, are efficient and robust solvers for isogeometric analysis. And if you uh, apply them together with an LUT smoother, they are uh, robust in the approximation of the P and the mesh with H. And furthermore, they are competitive to uh, the current state of the art uh, H multigrid methods. Uh, finally, we considered a block LUT smoother, which has some potential for parallelization in case of multi patch geometries. And if you're uh, interested in this and want to read more, I would like to refer to our paper, uh, which got recently accepted. Uh, you can either Google it or use the QR code on the slide. Uh, it will bring you directly to the web page. Um, some short outlook. Uh, we would like to uh, get some more insight in why this LUT smoother is so effective. And uh, we mainly want to further explore the block LUT smoother to see how we can uh, exploit parallelism in it and um, um, well apply it to uh, more uh, benchmark problems. Uh, finally, I would like to state that uh, all these numerical examples have been produced by using Gizmo, a C++ uh, library specifically designed for isogeometric analysis. Um, and with that, I would like to conclude my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. All right, so thanks for a uh, very nice talk. Uh, again, are there questions or remarks? So Paul just says no questions so far. Maybe um, wait for a second. Is there any question coming up? Uh, let me ask in, in between um, the, the examples that, that you have shown were mostly 2D. Is there any difficulty expected when you go 3D or anything if they put yes. the block together? Or, or something so we also uh, in the paper we also have a 3d example actually uh, again it's one equation but it's in 3d uh, and basically what we see there is that the results are to a large extent uh, similar to 2d um, the only thing of course is that um, if you look at uh, a number of non zeros in the matrix assembly costs that all uh, grows quite fast in the dimensions of course uh, especially for high order B spines. But if you look at the results, it's quite similar. All right. Uh, can, can you, uh, maybe I've missed that, exploit uh, the tensor product structure of, of B splines in, in some way? Yeah, actually, if you uh, uh, look at uh, recent research in IGA, I think quite often they exploit the tensor product structure. Uh, for example, you can do that in the assembly of the matrices. Uh, so uh, at this moment in the CPU uh, overview, you saw that the assembly is, is quite costly, so to say. Um, and you can exploit the tensor product to significantly reduce the assembly uh, costs. So yeah, definitely there are um, uh, ways to, to, uh, to exploit that. You could even think about a coarse grid correction that is based on uh, but that doesn't have like the geometry factor in it, and then you could even use it in your coarse grid correction. 